The AMD R3 1200 CPU teaches much the same lesson as the R7 1700 CPU did about its counterparts. Buying the cheaper unit in the series and applying a quick overclock instantly saves significantly on cost and does so while offering bolstered performance with minimal effort. Today we're reviewing the AMD R3 1200 CPU for power, gaming performance, and production performance with points of note from the R3 1300X, G4560, R5 CPUs, and more. Before that, this is brought to you by EVGA's CLC280 liquid cooler for CPUs, which we previously benchmarked and found to be a high performer given its relative silence to the temperature output. Learn more about this $140 cooler at the link in the description below. The R3 1200 CPU is the other one in the line of AMD's R3 products. The 1200 and the 1300X, and that's it for the R3s. Beyond that, the 1500, 1600, 1600X, and 1400 are a bit unique in the Ryzen lineup in that they have different core and thread counts depending on which one you're looking at. So the 1200 and 1300X are more similar to the R7 series where you have the same core specs, eight cores, 16 threads for everything. And all that really changes is the frequency out of the box. And then after that point, you can basically just rely on overclocking to get as close as possible to the higher end SKUs, if not beyond them, depending on how lucky you get with the CPU you buy. So the 1200 mirrors that experience of the R7s, where the 1300X makes a whole lot less sense if you're willing to overclock. Not everyone's willing to overclock, of course, and so there's reason for the 1300 to exist. It just, for our audience, we really would encourage the extra couple minutes to OC something and then spend 20 less bucks in this case. But we need to test it to see how it does before even talking about overclocking and that value add from the OC. So the 1200 is a $110 SKU, 1300X is a $130 SKU, and then after that point you start getting into the R5 series, where we previously recommended the R5 1600X in our editor's choice lineup as the best CPU in that price category, meaning we would recommend it over the i5s. The low end is still kind of held by the G4560 for an ultra cheap, very budget oriented option, and in our GPU bottleneck testing on that CPU, we found it scales quite well up to a GTX 1060 or RX 580 type of GPU. But now, in the middle of the pack, we're looking at R3s. The 1200 ships four cores, four threads, 3.1 gigahertz base and 3.4 gigahertz boost. And then beyond that, we really just need to test it to see how it does. So we're starting with gaming for this one, moving into Blender and Premiere testing next, following up with power testing and then the conclusion. As always, click the link in the description below for the full article, which contains all of the testing methods and extra charts that won't be present in this video, including extra synthetic workloads. You can find all of that in the full article on gamersnexus.net. Starting with Total War Warhammer with high settings, the R3 1200 CPU performs at 109 FPS average with 1% lows at 65.8 and 0.1% lows at 59 FPS. This ties the R3 1200 with the nigh unattainable but highly desirable Pentium G4560, which may as well be a processor of myth at this point given its unattainable status. However, this has gotten a bit better in the recent days. The G4600 is at least more available than the 4560 has been. The 4560, though, runs at roughly the same frame rate across the board. Its numbers were entered prior to the latest Total War update, so you could expect a slight uptick in performance. Regardless, this gives us an accurate depiction of how both CPUs perform relative to one another. Unlike the G4560, however, the 1200 overclocks. With a 3.9 GHz OC, we jump to 127 FPS average on the R3 1200 for an improvement of 15.7% over the stock 1200 CPU. This also puts us pretty damn close to the 1300X when it was overclocked to 4.1 GHz at 129 FPS average, and that difference ultimately comes down to frequency. If they were both 3.9 or 4.1, they would be identical in performance. Our 1200 got stuck at 3.9 GHz, but just like the R7 CPUs, equal clocks would provide equal performance here. This makes the R3 1200 a much better value for anyone willing to overclock, as you save $20 right away and can achieve the same performance once clocked higher. The Intel i3-7300 CPU is still sold for around $150, though we've heard rumors of drops lately. And so it's a poor value compared to the $110 R3-1200 overclock CPU, which performs effectively identically at 3.9 GHz and $40 cheaper. For an overclock on a $110 part, that's good performance, and it's just interesting that it happens to eat away at 
AMD's own lineup, the R3 1300X, making the 1200 a much more exciting launch than the 1300X was. In Battlefield 1, the 1200 stock CPU performs about 8.4% slower than the 1300X when both are stock at 101 FPS average versus 110 FPS average, but overclocking again serves as a great equalizer of AMD parts. The 1200 overclocked the 3.9 GHz runs an average FPS of 115.5, effectively identical to the average FPS of the 1300X, which is 116 at 4.1 GHz. For comparison, our G4560 operates between the stock and overclocked R3 1200 entries at 112 FPS average, with the R5 CPUs performing markedly better at 126 average minimally, or 136 average for the overclocked 1600X that previously won our Editor's Choice Award. In Watch Dogs 2, the AMD R3 1200 stock CPU performs around where the overclocked Phenom 2X 6090T does, and behind the R3 1300X stock by about 9%. Overclocking the R3 1200 boosts us to 53 FPS average, placing the 1200 OC a step beyond the Intel Pentium G4560 and a step below the Intel i3-6300 and the AMD R3 1300X OC CPU. Ashes of the Singularity positions the R3 1200 stock CPU about equal with Intel's Pentium G4560, but otherwise predictably at the bottom of our current gen listings. Overclocking bolsters performance significantly, however, jumping frame rate by 22.1%, which allows the CPU to tie the 7300 and follow the 1300X overclock CPU. For Ashes Escalation, Metro, and GTA 5 results, check the article below, but we'll move on to Blender and Premiere next. Blender wasn't stable with our 3.9 GHz overclock, so we stepped down to 3.8 for this test. The R3 1200 stock CPU completes the scene render in 102 minutes, so it takes 14% longer than the stock 1300X, and overclocking gets the CPU down to 87 minutes, about tied with the 1300X. Because we're down to just 4 cores, 4 threads on these R3 CPUs, performance here isn't exciting. It's not bad, as stated in our 1300X review yesterday, but it's also just not that interesting. If rendering really is of interest for you, and if using a CPU for rendering is on the agenda more than infrequent intervals, we would recommend strongly the R5 1500X or 1600 for purchase. The cost is higher, hence not recommending a higher-end part like an i9 to be extreme, but the render times are halved with an R5 1600 class CPU, especially once overclocking into higher territory. That's a major savings in time for anyone rendering even in light freelance capacities, and that time will pay off. Premiere is more of the same. The R3 1200 stock CPU takes 198 minutes to complete the render. The Overclock 1300X, which is right where the 1200 would perform when overclocked too, completes the render in 156 minutes. Compared to the R5 CPUs in the 80 to 130 minute range, this is significantly slower. R3 CPUs really aren't meant for these tasks, and again, we'd recommend a bump up in tiering if rendering on the CPUs in the plans. Most of our Premiere workloads would accelerate fine on GPUs though, so it just depends on what you're doing. Moving on to power testing next, as stated in our R3 1300X review, power consumption at the EPS 12 volt rails is still brand new testing for us, and so we are no longer testing at the wall. This is different and means that we get a more accurate measurement of what the CPU is actually doing rather than what the whole system is doing. Bear with us though while we add more CPUs to these presently sparse charts. Idle at the Windows 10 desktop, the R3 1200 is presently our lowest power consumption CPU at 2.5 watts idle consumption, followed by both the 1300X and 1700 CPUs. Overclocking the R3 1200 to 3.9 GHz with a 0.1 volt offset gets us to 9.8 watts idle, followed by the 1300X at 4 GHz. Using a real-world Blender animation project for the next test, we get a glimpse at power consumption under a 100% rendering load scenario. The R3 1200 CPU consumes 28 watts of power via EPS 12 volt cables when rendering at stock settings, placing it about 32% lower than the R3 1300X. In actual render performance, as we just saw a moment ago, the difference is a 13% time reduction with the 1300X. Overclocking both pushes to 46 watts on the R3 1200 and 52 on the 1300X, both reasonably low power consumption for a part of this class, but obviously boosted with the OC. The difference between them is largely that extra 200 megahertz or 100 megahertz, depending on the OC ceiling for each CPU. This is a stark contrast from AMD's old reputation with CPUs. It seems that the company has largely resolved its FX era high power and high thermal reputation, which of course the two coincide and go hand in hand. So thermals are reduced in step with power consumption. Moving next to Firestrike's physics test, another real world scenario, we see power consumption at about 27 watts for the R3 1200 and 44 watts for the overclocked variant. Drawing more than the 7350K happens in part because of the additional physical hardware for the four core configuration. The architecture is also obviously a bit different. The R3 1300X lands at 38 watts stock and 47 watts when overclocked, 
just like with the R7 CPUs, overclocking is a great equalizer for AMD's SKUs. Total War, Warhammer is next. The R3 1200 runs the game at 30 watts peak during the benchmark with the 1300X stock CPU at 41.8 watts. The overclocked variants draw 49 watts and 54 watts respectively. Again, we're well within reasonable power consumption metrics for parts of these specs. Finally, Prime 95 28.5 gives a more torturous workload and lands the R3 1200 at 41 watts with the 1300X consuming 39% more at 57 watts. Overclocking increases power consumption on the R3 1200 by 48% landing at 60 watts and near the R3 1300X at 64 watts. The R3 1200 is in a significantly more advantaged position than the 1300X and continues the interesting trend AMD has going with its stack. Just like with the R7 series, it seems most wise to purchase the lower tier unit of the R3 CPUs, as they're both four core, four thread parts, unlike the mixed thread R5 parts, and then opt for an overclock after that. Overclocking these CPUs is trivial, and we strongly encourage the couple minute venture to push to at least 3.8 GHz on the 1200. Performance uplift is noteworthy and matches the 1300X equivalently, but with a lower price, by $20 in this case. As for gaming performance, that's the interesting position. The i5 CPUs are already challenged in their value proposition by the R5 CPUs. We talked about that in our R5 reviews. No reason to recap all of that here. So the i5s have been threatened already in their position on the market. The i3s have also been threatened, but not by AMD, by Intel's 4560, which is still a good performer, albeit somewhat difficult to get a hold of. It's still out there, and there are counterparts to the 4560 that you can get more easily. So the i3 CPUs have long been cannibalized by Intel's own Pentium series for this launch. That makes the R3s interesting. They further hurt the i3, i5 proposition, as now we've got this mix where R5s kind of make sense in the mid-range area, i7s, the 7700K, that is, makes sense in the high-end area for gaming if you want 144 FPS unrestricted or something. And then the 1700 does fine as a cheap HEDT part from AMD. Where we don't know what's going on is below the R5s, until today anyway, the G4560, still as of today, makes the most sense for an ultra-budget system where you really just want the cheapest parts you can get, throw them in a build, and run a GPU of reasonable power. You can get up to an RX 570 or a GTX 1060 pretty reasonably with one of those and not really choke your GPU all that much. That's still a good part. It's still performing well, and that hasn't changed. The R5 1600 series CPUs still remain our go-to for the mid-range. The R3s kind of fill the gap between the 4560 and the R5s. They're there in the financial sense, at least. But the performance isn't as exciting as the R5 CPUs. So... It's not a bad CPU, and saying that something is adequate certainly isn't offensive in and of itself, unless there are expectations there that maybe weren't realistic. But then again, just to emphasize, the CPU does well in testing and it's positioned competitively in the market. So it's not bad in either of those aspects. It somewhat invalidates the 1200, that is the 1300X, just by nature of overclocking. But it's not something where we're gonna say, just go buy this right now, because that's kind of, reserved for special CPUs like the R5 1600X or 1600, where we were really impressed with the performance at the price point, and these just aren't that special. They're not bad. Just want to make that clear. Saying something isn't the go-to recommendation doesn't mean we're saying it's bad. It just means that it's not that exciting. So if you think it's more exciting, great. Go buy it. It's out there for 110 bucks. As always, you can find more in the article in the description below. Hopefully these numbers help you figure out and make your own decision, because that's really the goal of these. You can tweet at us, as always, for suggestions on topics or to get quick help at GamersNexus. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus if you want to join our Discord. Probably going to answer you more directly and more in depth. Otherwise, subscribe for more. GamersNexus.squarespace.com for shirts. I'll see you all next time.